Welcome to Preaching That Matters. A place you can find apostolic Pentecostal preaching. A place where all generations can be fed with the Word of God. We hope you enjoy.
the Spirit lifted him up by the hair of the head and carried him back to Jerusalem. He was in captivity on the river Kibar. He had to have hair for the Holy Ghost taken by the hair of the head carry him over to Jerusalem. Quite a trip, 500 miles. He was in Iraq where the war is going on now by the river Kibar <clears throat> and uh, he was in the second dispersion of the captivity. Daniel was in the first and Daniel was taken to the city of Babylon. Nine years later, the second dispersion took place and Ezekiel was taken captive and carried over about 300 miles northwest of Babylon to the river Kibar and there he was set down in that area. And the Bible says that he was in his own house with the elders of Israel. And I don't know whether he had, what kind of a house he had, but he was in his own house. And I want to just drop this in. The Holy Ghost can move in your home just like he can in church if you allow him to. Hallelujah. He was sitting in his own house and the Spirit of God took him up by the hair of the head and lifted him and carried him about 500 miles south to, to Jerusalem. Now, whether he went physically or just in a, in, a, in, a, in a spiritual sense, I don't know. Maybe you know, but I don't. But he went back to Jerusalem, and there the Lord began to reveal things to him and tell him what was going on in Jerusalem. And the amazing thing was that here's a captive over in, in a foreign land that prophesied not to the captives, but prophesied back to Jerusalem concerning what was going on in Jerusalem and concerning the remnant that was back there. So the, prophe the prophecy of, the, of, of Ezekiel is a very unique, distinctive prophecy. And we're going to read a few verses beginning at the ninth chapter, verse 1 of Ezekiel and here we see where what he saw in Jerusalem is revealed well actually it is in the eighth chapter that's revealed but we see something else as we begin reading in the ninth chapter he cried also in mine ears with a loud voice saying cause them that have charge over the city to draw near even every man with a destroying weapon in his hand the old six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a rider's inkhorn by his side, and they, were, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the rider's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city to the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations to be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary, then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain, go ye forth. They went forth and slew in the city. Now verse 11. And behold, a man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. I want to dedicate this message to those that are called to the ministry. How many of you are called? You know you have a call to the ministry. Let me see your hand. Numbers of you. All right. Most, in fact, is I would say at least half of you feel that definite call to the ministry. You are the man with the writers in common. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, talk to us today, we pray. Let the Holy Ghost deal with us, draw us close to you, help us understand, Lord, this place that you called us to fill. We pray the blessing of the Lord upon this hour we spend together. Oh, may our hearts be lifted up. 
to draw near to thee and let your spirit speak to us things that will help us in our life and walk with you. We give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. you may be seated. Praise the Lord. Now, what the Spirit showed Ezekiel was very amazing. First of all, he took him by the way close to the brazen altar of the temple, and there they had set up an image called the image of jealousy, and we're worshiping it. Actually, what it refers to is the fact that God is a jealous God, and anything in your life that you put before him is an idol. And whatever it is in your life that you put before the Lord, or if it keeps you from being the man God wants you to be, has become an idol in your life. So this image, which, which represents all that would draw us away from God, was set up actually by the brazen altar. And Ezekiel was horrified that in the sacred precincts of the temple, there would be this, this desecration. And so then the Spirit said to him, Come here, Ezekiel, I'll show you greater abominations than this. And he went by the wall, and there he saw a hole in the wall. And the Lord said to him, Dig! And he dug with the hole. He began to pull the substance off and enlarge the hole until there was a door there. The Lord told him to open the door. And he opened the door, and he went into the temple itself. And there in the sanctuary of the temple there were the elders of Israel. Every man, uh, Jazani, the son of Shaphan, was one of them. He was swinging the censer of incense and worshiping, but not worshiping God, because on the walls they had painted all kinds of heathen, hideous monstrosity, monstrosities which were the heathen gods, creeping, crawling creatures that were an abomination unto the Lord. And they were worshiping them and they were saying that we're doing this in the dark and nobody can see it because we are doing this in the dark and God doesn't even know it. And we can do as we please and worship any God we want to and do as we please in the dark. The Bible says every man in the chambers of his imagery. Now, in a sense, I mentioned this in one of our classes, in a sense, we all have a chamber of imagery. And we can retreat into that chamber any time we want to. And we can do as we please because we say to ourselves, nobody knows what I'm thinking. And I can imagine anything I want to imagine. I can kill somebody in here. I can retreat in there. My wife doesn't even know what I'm doing here. My husband doesn't know what I'm doing here. I can do as I please. But God knows what's going on in the chambers of your imagery because he knows our thoughts are far off. Hallelujah. And even before we think the thought, he knows it. So he knows exactly what we're doing. And they were deceiving themselves when they say that God doesn't know it, God doesn't care, because God did know it, and it was an abomination to him what they were doing. The Lord says, Come here, Ezekiel, I'll show you greater abominations than these. And he took him a little further. And there was women with their faces toward the sun weeping for Tammuz. Now Tammuz was the second person of the ancient Babylonian trinity. The ancient Babylonian trinity of the original false religion of the earth was in the time of Nimrod. Was, Nimrod was the author of the first heathen religion out of which all the other false religions of the earth had sprung. And it had a trinity in it. Nimrod married his own mother, who was, her name was Semiramis. And as time went on, uh, uh, he, he was killed by a wild boar. And Semiramis said that Nimrod had ascended into heaven and become a god. To whoredom, she became the child, and to cover her sin, 
he said that Nimrod had come down and been with her, and therefore she was the child. And the child was to be a son of God. The child was named Tammuz, the second person of the ancient heathen trinity. So the original heathen trinity was composed of Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. And so there were statues erected all through the land of Babylon of a woman, Semiramis, with a baby Tammuz in her arms the Son of God, a God himself. And so, as worship went on, as they worshipped the child, later on, it gravitated to her, and she was worshipped, the first Madonna and child. And of course, as you know, as you study history, you know that all these Babylonian mysteries came over and were, and were brought over into so-called Christian religion in the second and third centuries, and we have today much of this that I'm telling you about in our Christian religion, so-called churches of the world today. But the first, the original trinity was a man, a woman, and a child. And these women were weeping for Tammuz, worshiping the second person of the ancient heathen trinity. So the Lord said, all right, I'll show you even greater abominations. And there were 25 of the elders of Israel with their backs toward the temple and their faces toward the sun, worshiping the sun, ancient sun worship. Now these were all abominations going on in the temple by the people of God, supposedly the priesthood, supposedly the elders of Israel, the leaders of the people were all involved in these terrible, horrible a uh, heathen abomination. And so then it was that the Lord said, I want the, those that are in charge of the city to come forth. Now the devil thinks he's in charge of the city. This city and every other city. He says, I'm in charge around here. He thinks he's taken over Houston. He thinks he's taken over San Diego. He thinks he's taken over all the cities of America, the cities of the world. They're mine. He claims them for his own. That's right. And he says they belong to me. In fact, he told Jesus that. He showed him all the kingdoms of the earth and the glory of them and said they're mine. And I'll give them to you if you'll fall down and worship me. So he claims them for his own. So when the Lord said, let those that are in charge of the city come forth, six men stepped out. And these men, every one of them, had destroying weapons in their hands. Now, I don't know what actually, what they represented, but I kind of have, I'd like, to, I'd like to illustrate it this way. That one was Monday, and one was Tuesday, and one was Wednesday, and one was Thursday, and one was Friday, and one was no school. So we have at least six of them there. And uh, they all had destroying weapons in their hand. Now, let's, let's, let's look at it this way. Suppose you had children. Now, you, most of you are young, and you say, well, this doesn't apply to me, but it will someday, maybe. You had children, and they were in the city. And the devil said, I'm going to get your children. And he's determined to get them and destroy them. And he is just trying to destroy this generation. You know he is. You have friends that he's destroyed. You have relatives that he's taken and twisted their lives and destroyed them. And you know what, it hap what happens to them. So the devil says, that's my business. That's what I'll do. So he sends forth, we send forth our children into the pagan schools because the schools of America are pagan schools. God is outlawed. They are heathen schools. We send our children to the heathen to train for us, to teach for us. And we let the pagans put things into their minds. All right? So Monday, uh, let me, here. I'm going to get some of you fellas up here. You know, to help you preach. One, two, three, four, five, six. Come on, right up. Here. Demons. I mean, 
I mean, you are actually, you're actually demon powers at work. You've got destroying weapons in your hand. That's right. You're out to destroy, and the devil cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Didn't he say it? Didn't the word say it? That's his business. You say he hadn't ought to do it, but that's what he's there for to do. He's going to do it. All right, so that's what you are. You are those demon powers that's at work trying to destroy our children, trying to destroy the society in which we live. You say, I'm in charge of this city, and we'll take it over. They're the fellows that claim to be in charge, and the devil says, I'm in charge here, and these fellows are doing my job for me. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, no school. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. So there they are. Now, just a minute. Stay there. Praise the Lord. Everybody said praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. Now, Monday, raise your hand, Monday. There you are, Monday. You've got a destroying weapon of humanism. This is the unofficial religion of America, humanism. Man is the center. God is not. God has no place. So humanism is a weapon that God, that the devil is using to destroy, and he's got it, all right? Tuesday, you are New Age and the occult, and that's the false religion that has come on the scene and is actually gaining credence all over America. I was in a bookstore the other day, and I noticed that there was one shelf that had Bibles on it and religious uh, books. And there were six shells with New Age stuff. It's gaining, my friend. It's gaining in America today. So Tuesday, you're the New Age. That's the destroying weapon you've got of the New Age and the occult. Wednesday, raise your hand. Wednesday, you are narcotics and crime. I know it's, pretty, it's a pretty dirty business. <laughs> but you've got to, somebody's, the devil says, that's your business. And of course, since you're a demon, you delight in doing that. And then Thursday, oh, Thursday, where is Thursday? Thursday, you are lust and immorality. <laughs> Lord help us. That's right. And free sex and all that goes with it, abortion and pornography and all the rest of it. Dear Lord help us. I'm sorry for you, but that's the way it is. All right. Really, it's nothing to laugh about. We laugh, but it's nothing to laugh about. It's pretty serious business. It's destroying our young people. It really is. It's a destructive weapon today that the devil is using to destroy this generation. Right. And so we come to Friday. And Friday, your materialism and easy money and affluence and things, the desire for things, desire for wealth and desire to latch on to money, and it, it goes along with crime and all the rest of it. And so... Uh, uh, Tuesday with the, with the with, or Wednesday with the narcotics and crime and and Friday uh, with the, with the easy money and so forth kind of go hand in hand, but it's the time that uh, people are wanting to ride high and not pay a price for what they get. In other words, they're just wanting to get it any way they can, and the devil tells them you have a right to to all this stuff. You don't have to work. You can do it the easy way. Okay. Now we come to no school. And he's the fella that says, we don't have time for God. We'll go out on the boat and have pleasure. And we'll just have a good time. Pleasure and riding high in the RVs and just go out and just have a wonderful time in the world and forget God. And over every weekend, you see, you're just going to leave town and go on your boat and take your RV and and pleasure and so forth and leave God out because God has no place in our lives so here we have these six demons including pleasure and they all have destroying weapons in their hands they're out to destroy our generation they're out to destroy our children they're out to destroy everything that's decent they're out to, they'd like to destroy our churches. They'd like to just take over. And the devil says they're in charge. They're going to take over everything. But God's not through. 
Do you think God's going to let this thing go on unchecked? Somehow, somebody's got to take a stand. Isn't that right? Amen. Let's stay there just a minute. Let me tell you something. The question is this. Who cares that these things are going on? When the Lord said, I'm going to find out if there's anybody that cares that these abominations are being carried on. Is anybody concerned about it? Does anybody feel about it? Does anybody really, does anybody sigh and cry? Or is that sort of old-fashioned that nobody cares anymore? Somebody needs to care about what's going on in our world today. Somebody needs to be concerned about the fact that, uh, that the devil's riding high. And, and, uh, but there has to be a standard raised. When the enemy comes in like a flood, somebody has to unite with the Lord and raise up a standard against the enemy. The Holy Ghost will raise up a standard against the power of the devil. Hallelujah. So the Lord says, I've got a man. I've got a man. I want one of you young preachers to come. You, are you a preacher? Come on. There's a man clothed in linen. I want you to, here, get away. Go over, right over here. Stand right here. Brother, the Lord's got one. Now, this, this might be called Sunday school. I don't know. With all these Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we got Sunday here. But anyhow, you are the man with linen, clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn at his side. Because we do not, this represents the writing that God does. Because we do not write with ink. The Holy Ghost does not write with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. We're epistles that have been written, known and read of all men. So it takes the Holy Ghost to write, do that kind of writing. So it is represented by the man with the writer's inkhorn by his side. And he is, he represents the church. You represent every preacher. You are the man that God says is in charge of the city. These fellows say they're in charge. God says you're in charge. In charge of the city. I've got a man here in this city that's going to raise up a standard. He is salvation for this city. He is my man for the city. I have put him in charge. Hallelujah. So God has a man in charge. And when you're called by the Holy Ghost... To be a minister, God puts you in a place of responsibility. You can't shed it. You're not to be a clown. You're not to be a comedian. You're not just to entertain people. You're here to deliver men and women from the power of the devil, from these fellows. You're here with the power of God in your life, hallelujah, to write upon men and put a mark on them, hallelujah, till they can never get away from it, that they're marked for time and for all eternity. Can you say praise the Lord? So we've got a man with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and he's a preacher. Hallelujah. He has the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ that he declares, and his job is to mark everyone he can reach, to put a mark on them. And somehow or other, when you get young people in the church and they come under the influence of the Holy Ghost and the preaching of the Word, they'll never be the same again. Something has happened to them. A mark has been put on them that uh, will, cannot be erased. And you know and I know that if a person with the Holy Ghost backslides, uh, they cannot enjoy the world anymore like they used to. They're marked. There's something different about them. They can never be the same again. They cannot fit in like they used to. That's why they sometimes go worse and worse and worse in sin, trying to find happiness in the world. They never find it because they have a mark on them. Mark on them. And our job is to mark as many as we can reach, as many as we can reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when these fellows come along and they, reach some, they come to somebody that's marked, they can't touch them. Hallelujah. They've been delivered from the power of the devil. Hallelujah. Set free. They can't touch them. They can't destroy them. They're set free. They're delivered. Hallelujah. From anything the devil can throw at them. Let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> praise God. Thank you, boys. I appreciate it. God bless you. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now that's the picture of the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. Now as we get into it a little further, we see this, that even though they claim to be in charge, God says, I have put my man in charge of this city. He is a deliverer. He is a man with a message of deliverance. He is a man with a message of salvation. 
He's the only one that has the true message of salvation. Others may come and think they've got an answer. Nobody has an answer like a Holy Ghost filled, Jesus name, tongue talking, uh, uh, minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's God's man for that city. Hallelujah. God said, I put him in charge. How about his weapon? What has he got for a weapon? He doesn't have a destroying weapon. He's got a saving weapon. Hallelujah. And uh, so even though the others may come and, uh, and, and uh, seem to take over for a while, I believe that God has a church, and this church will prevail. Amen. Right. This church will prevail. When the ministry of the church is finished, when the uh, thing is all over with and everybody is marked that can be marked, tribulation is coming. Sa uh, uh, Houston ought to thank God that there is a Bible school here and there's a church here in the city of Houston. Every town that has a Jesus name church ought to thank God that in that town there is a church. There is a man with a writer's inkhorn by his side to hold back the power of the enemy, hallelujah, and to bring salvation and deliverance to that city. They ought to throw, uh, roll out the red carpet for us when we come to a town. They ought to give us the finest building in town. They ought to say, this is yours because you bring salvation when you come. We know they won't do that, but they ought to do it if they realized what we have to offer, that we have the best news anybody has ever heard. Hallelujah. We've got life. We've got power. We've got deliverance. We've got freedom. Hallelujah. We've got, we've got the answer to the pollutions of the world. We've got the answer to crime. We've got the answer to delinquency. We've got the answer to it. Hallelujah. Amen. And everybody needs what we've got. It's not something that is just optional. Everybody needs it. Praise the Lord. So we've got something that's wonderful. We've got the job of putting a mark on all as many as we can before the destroying weapons come. Amen. Children, somebody, somebody says, are children going to be slain too with these destroying weapons? Yes. In fact, is the devil likes to reach children. So don't think you're wasting your time when you have Sunday school. Don't think you're wasting your time when you have children's church. Don't think that it's a waste of time to spend time with a little child. I want you to know you're saving something that's valuable when you save a little child. Praise the Lord. I heard some time ago that, that um, an evangelist was asked this, what results he had in a certain city as he preached. He said, I had two and a half. Oh, I, the person said, I see what you mean. You had two adults and one child. No, no, no. He said, I had one adult and two children. He said the adult was only a half because half of his life is already gone. The child is a full life. So when the child is saved, you're not only saving a little child, you're saving his whole life. Praise the Lord. So it's extremely valuable and important that we understand and have our understanding cor correct that we're reaching not only men and women but we're reaching children we're reaching lives hallelujah we're reaching the lost we're reaching them before the destroying weapons can get them praise the Lord and you that are Sunday school teachers let me tell you this you have a great ministry you have an important ministry hallelujah don't think that because you're not up in the pulpit you don't have an important ministry it's a vital ministry of putting a mark on those children let me tell you about a young man that came to our church, and uh, he was, uh, he was, uh, 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 his mother was a go-go dancer, uh, putting it in, a, in a, as nice a way as I can. And uh, so she, but uh, uh, through our bus ministry, why we reached out and uh, got a hold of him, and he lived at the, at the end of a, uh, the street, or the bus line, and then there was a, about a quarter of a mile walk down a dirt road to get to his house. And there was a Sunday school teacher by the name of Ruby Sharp that we had in those days that was one of the most dedicated of all of our staff. And uh, she would go out. when If he was absent, she would go out. And she did not have a car. She would go to the end of the bus line and walk that quarter of a mile down that dirt road to visit him. Now, if, she, if his mother was there, she would lace into her and curse her and berate her and tear her to pieces. So she risked it 
when she went out to that house. She risked a, a real, uh, because a mother hated the church, hated us, hated this message, hated what we were doing to her child, her, fine, her boy. She only had the boy. That's all she had, just one child. Her husband was gone. Maybe she never had a husband. I don't know. But anyhow, that was the situation. So Ruby went out there and brought the boy and kept her hand on, her, on him and prayed with him. And one day in Sunday school, he gave his heart to God. And uh, I don't know whether it was in Sunday school or not, but he got the Holy Ghost just very shortly there, and we baptized him in Jesus' name. That mother was fit to be tied. She was just, she cursed and raved and tore and ranted. She hated us. She hated this gospel. She hated the message. And the, but the boy stayed there for about three years, and Ruby and some of the other young people worked with that young man and worked with him and helped him, and he got really grounded in the truth. And that mother decided about the three years later, she says, I'm going to get my boy away from that church. So she got a job in Chicago, and she moved to Chicago. And the boy, of course, had to go with his mother. But God was way ahead of her. And the amazing thing was that where she had moved, unbeknownst to her, one block away was the United Pentecostal Church. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> That really happened. Now, it's amazing. And the boy didn't take him long to find out that that church was right there. And he went to that church. And uh, after a while, he went to Bible school. And he graduated from one of our Bible schools and became a preacher. While he was in Bible school, he'd go visit his mother. Sometimes some of the other young people of the Bible school would go with him. He'd have to go down to the lower end of town to some honky-tonk, some cabaret or something down there, and go in the back door. And there was his mother as a dancer and an uh, exotic dancer, so-called, and so forth. And he'd have to visit her under those conditions. But I want you to know he stood true to God. He lived for God. He was marked. He was marked. Hallelujah. He was ruined for the devil and for the world. Hallelujah. God had his hand on him. He became one of our preachers. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I tell you, folks, I want you to know that this marking business is the greatest job and the greatest privilege you have in all the world, hallelujah, to mark people for God. Let's praise the Lord together, hallelujah. Glory to God, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. The moment a Sunday school scholar leaves a Sunday school, all the satanic powers of the devil are unleashed against him. That's right. Think of turning a child out to face these demons that we saw here with their destroying weapons. And yet that's what we're doing here in America today. What chance does a kid have that's sent out of a godly home to face this crew alone? And yet when we send them to the pagan schools, that's exactly what happens. They're faced with all of that kind of stuff. They need to get something. We've got to instill into them something that'll hold them. Amen. Against all that the devil can throw at them. That's right. All the opposition, all the, the uh, demon-inspired propaganda that uh, fills our pagan schools today to try to turn our children away from God. As though God was not important enough even to think about, they absolutely ignore the existence of God in a school and will not even refer to Him. The Bible is outlawed. Prayer is outlawed. And so we're faced with that situation. And my friend, I want you to know we have a task on our hands. Some of you came through school living for God. You know what it is to face all of this kind of stuff and come through victorious. Hallelujah. You can do it. You can do it. It can be done. And the only way it can be done is by the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I remember a few years ago, Brother... Uh, Davis told me, Brother Harvey Davis, who was a missionary in Africa, told me the only answer when he was in Liberia, the only answer to devil society, devil bush society, was the mighty power of the Holy Ghost and the name of Jesus. He said, we have found out that when a young person comes from devil bush, out of devil bush in that uh, 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 society over there in Africa, comes out of that society and gets baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, God can keep him. Because that society demands that that youngster go back into devil bush. And there's some that got the Holy Ghost before the age when they were pulled into that 
and they were delivered from it. He said, while we were there, some natives from far off into the interior, maybe two or three hundred miles, came to our compound, he told me. And they said they made that trip all for the purpose of finding out, asking this question, Do, are your young people delivered from devil bush? They said, yes. They do not go into devil bush. He said, you are the only people we know of where the children are delivered, the, uh, the boys are delivered from going into devil bush. We don't know any other religion. The Presbyterians say go into devil bush. The Baptists say go into devil bush. Even Trinity Pentecostals say go into devil bush. But the Jesus name boys did not go into devil bush. They were delivered. And they wanted to know the secret of it. Hallelujah. When they told them the power of the name of Jesus, and they told them that the power of the Holy Ghost and the name of Jesus delivered those boys from devil bush. Hallelujah. They said, this is what we want. We want the, this thing that delivers our young people from the power of the devil. If it will deliver those young people over there from devil bush, it will deliver our boys and our girls from the power of the devil here in America. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Even David Wilkerson said in his book,